In today's tutorial, we're going to be using Blender version 4.3 to create this particular sci-fi animation that's going to be perfectly looping. I'm going to keep it very slow so that even beginners can actually understand the step-by-step -step usage of geometry nodes, shader editor, as well as the compositor. So with that, let's actually go ahead and begin this tutorial. In our default scene, we're going to bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows. We're going to click and drag to create a new window and we're going to switch this from the 3D viewport to the geometry node editor. Then we'll press this plus button to create a new geometry node tree, after which we can just zoom in, select the group input and tap delete to delete the default cube. Now the main process that we're gonna try to follow is create a bunch of points present within a sphere and see the number of points that are outside another sphere and push them to another distance. So it'll be much easier once we start creating the actual animation. So the step one is going to be to distribute a bunch of points within a sphere. So let's press Shift A, search for an icosphere, which is going to be the shape within which we distribute the points. So let's plug that into the group output and let's increase the radius from one meter to something like five meters. And let's also increase the subdivisions from one to something like three. Now that we have the icosphere, we can go ahead and press Shift A and search for a mesh to volume node and plug that in after the icosphere node just like that. Now, the reason we're doing this is so that we have a volume within which we can distribute points. So let's press Shift A and search for a distribute points in volume node and plug that in after the mesh to volume. Now we can always play around with the density, but for the tutorial purposes, I'm currently going to keep the density at something like 30. Maybe I'll increase it just before rendering. Now, if we actually take a look at this particular sphere, we have a sphere of points that are present all around like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually see which points are present outside a radius of, let's say, maybe four units. So let's say that's a sphere of radius four. I'm going to see what points are present outside this, and I'm going to map them back and change their position to be in the same place, but at a radius of three meters. So I'm going to push them down to this particular radius over here. So these points that are present in this little region over here, is going to remain exactly as they are. However, all the points that are outside this, which is these points over here, they're all going to get pushed right onto that surface down there. I hope that was clear, but let's go ahead and actually do that. The way we're going to do that is by using a set position node. So there's going to be two set positions that I'm going to use. One is going to be to create the motion and the other one is going to be to push them down into the particular sphere. So the first set position I'm going to do is by pressing Shift A, searching for set position and plugging that in over here. Now I'm going to duplicate it because I stated there needs to be two set positions. So let's press Shift D, and duplicate it. I'm going to mess around with the positions later on using this set position. But for now, to make that particular distribution of getting the points down to the second sphere, I'm going to use this second set position. So let's press Shift A and search for a position node so that we actually get the position of every single point. Remember, this position node is going to give us a vector that goes from the center origin to every single point, just like that. So it's going to be an arrow that points to each and every single particle in every single direction. So since we have that, it has a length as well as a direction. So we want to find out what the length of each of those are. We can press Shift A, search for a vector math node. And if you want to know exactly how the vector math node works, you can check out this video over here. But for today's tutorial, we're going to switch this from add to length, and we're going to plug the position into the vector. Now this value is going to tell us how far away each point is from the center, which is essentially the distance that we want. So let's compare it and see if it is greater than, let's say, four units, then we have to push it down to three units. So let's press Shift A and search for a compare node, and we want to compare this value with the number four. We say if this value is greater than a value of four, only then should we change the position of the point. So let's take this result and plug that into the selection. Now for the actual offset or the position, what we're going to do is we're going to take this same position and just press Shift D to duplicate it. But this time we're not going to be using the length of the position, but we want to use the direction. So to get the direction, we have to normalize it. That's also a vector math operation. So we're going to take this node, press Shift D to duplicate it and change this from length to normalize. Now this is going to give us an output with a length of one, but just the direction. Now that we have the direction, we can just scale it up by the radius that we want and it'll push it to the surface of the sphere of whatever radius we get. Before that, we need another vector math node. So let's press Shift D and change this from normalize to something like scale so that we can actually scale it up to the exact radius that we want. We said that everything that's outside four meters should get pushed down to three meters. So we're gonna change this scale down to three and now we can plug this into the position of 
the set position. Now you can see everything that was outside four got pushed down to three and is present right over there. I hope that made sense. And you can actually see that if we were to keep this at four, it would just take everything and put it onto the surface right there. If we were to increase this, you can see how it goes higher and we can even make it smaller just like this. Similarly, if you want more of this to be removed, you can just start decreasing this. And if you want less of it to be removed, you can start increasing it. So that is the control that we have. For now, I'm gonna keep it at four and this I'm gonna keep at a value of three. Now that I have that created, I can go ahead and play with the position of each of these points just so that there's a lot of motion going on. So to play around with that, I'm gonna use this first set position. And the reason why we're doing this set position before this is so that we don't push it into the sphere and then have it get displaced afterwards. We want the displacement to occur and if it's outside the sphere, it should get pushed in. So that's why we have this set position first. So to move it, we're gonna use a noise texture. So we can press Shift A and search for a noise texture. And if you wanna see how to loop noise textures, you can check this video over here. However, we're going to do it step-by-step step in this video as well. The first thing that we're gonna do is reduce the detail down to zero and we're gonna make the scale something really small. Let's go with something like 0 0.3. Now we're gonna press Shift D to create a duplicate and we're also going to change this from 3D to 4D on both of the sliders. Now that we have this, we're gonna mix them together by pressing Shift A and searching for a mix color node and plugging in this socket into A and this socket into B. So now that we have this created, we can go ahead and plug this into the offset of the set position. However, there's a few things that you'll notice. If you are to play around with the double W, the motion is like a little wiggling motion, but we, that's not exactly what we want. We need it to be a lot stronger. And the second thing is that these noise textures are normalized, which means they go from zero to one. However, we need them to go from minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. So to make those two changes, we'll press shift A and search for another vector math node. And we're going to plug that in after the mix node, after which we'll change it from add to subtract. Then we'll subtract a value of 0 0.5 on all of the axes. And after that, we can press shift D and change this from subtract to scale. Now we're going to go ahead and just scale it up to maybe something like 1.5 so that the effect is a lot stronger. And now if we actually play around with the W, we get more of the effect that we wanted. I think another thing is that this is currently fairly uniformly distributed. I want the distribution to be a lot more clunkier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this back to zero for now. And just after the mix color node, I'm going to separate out the different channels and make them clunky using a color ramp. So let's press shift A and search for a separate color node and plug that in right over here. And of course, once we separate it, we have to combine them again. So let's press shift A and search for a combined color node as well. Once we have this plugged in, the red can go to the red, the green can go to the green, and the blue can go to the blue. However, between them, I'm gonna actually press Shift A and search for a color ramp node so that we can make changes in between the separate and the combined. So once I plug it in over there, what I'm going to have to do is bring the slider in to a position very close to 0 0.5, Let's go with 0.49 and the white slider can be just above 0.5. So let's make it 0.51. So now that I have that, you can see it becomes a little more clunky with lesser particles present here, more particles present there. And we can do that on all three of the axes. So let's just collapse this by pressing that little arrow and then pressing Shift D and plugging it in right there and then Shift D and plugging it in over there as well. So this makes it a lot more lumped up. So now when we play around with this, we get a really nice motion that I really, really like. So let's keep this back down at zero. And then we're gonna go ahead and start off the animation of this particular looping project. So first we're gonna have to set the animation defaults. So let's go to the output properties and change the resolution to 200% so that we get a 4K animation. Remember, if you wanna get a 4K 60 FPS animation without having to set this up, you can always download them from my Patreon where you'll get the blend files along with the animations and wallpapers as a single purchase. Or if you join any one of the monthly tiers, you'll get each of them respectively. Now I want it to be 10 seconds long. So I'm gonna change the end frame to 600 and I'm gonna change the output folder to be the same folder in which it's saved. So ensure you actually save your blend file. Apart from that, the file format, I'm gonna choose FFmpeg video with the encoding changed from Matroska to MPEG4 and an output quality of perceptually lossless. Now that I have that, I'm gonna expand the timeline by just a little bit, and I'm going to press the back arrow to go all the way back to frame zero. If there are any keyframes present by default, you don't have to worry about them. You can always delete them if you want, 
by just tapping A and delete. Now on frame zero, we're gonna go ahead and hover over this W value and tap I. We're gonna change the factor down to zero and we're gonna also hover over it and tap I. And this we're gonna keep at a negative value. So maybe we'll go with something like minus 0.5 and we'll go ahead and tap I. Now we can just shift select all three of the nodes. And once you have them selected, we can come down here and tap T and choose linear. Then we're gonna go all the way to frame 600 and we're gonna go ahead and change this to a value of zero, this to a value of one, and this to the positive value of whatever negative value you had given over here. So let's make this now 0 0.5. If you want the animation to be faster, make these numbers greater. And if you want it to be slower, make them smaller. Now hover over it and tap I, I, and I. And now you should have a smooth animation. If in case it's still starting slow, speeding up in the middle, and then slowing down at the end, you can always tap A, T, and linear. And if you feel like it's too slow, go ahead and make this minus, let's say two, and we're gonna tap I after making the change. And over here at 600, I'm just gonna increase this value to a value of two, and then I'll tap I, and that should make the movement a lot faster. Remember, if it is lagging or slow, you have to change this playback from play every frame to frame dropping to get an estimate of exactly how fast the motion is going to be. Now that I like the motion, I want there to also be a rotation of the entire sphere. For that, I'm going to go back to frame zero, hover over the sphere and just tap I. That'll add in a keyframe for the location, rotation, and the scale. Then I'll go all the way to frame 600 and I'll press R, Z, 360. And then I'll tap I, which also adds in a keyframe. Then down here again, A, T, linear. And that way I get the entire thing rotating as well. Now that I have both of those created, I can start off with the actual texturing. For the texturing, I'm going to have to go over to the set position and first off set material for this particular particles. Before that, remember, these are currently just points and they don't have any dimensions, so they won't be rendered. So to make them renderable, I'll press Shift A and search for an instance on points node, and I'll actually instance an icosphere on each of them. Let's press Shift A and search for an icosphere and plug that in as the instance. Remember, this is going to be way too large. So I'm going to reduce the radius down to something like 0.01. And I'm going to then go ahead and set a material for this particular object. Let's press Shift A, search for a set material. And I can choose the default material since I'm not using any other objects in the scene. Apart from that, I do want the noise texture itself to determine the color that's present over here. Since I have the noise texture present all the way over here, I can take this and store this as a named attribute. So let's press shift A and search for a store named attribute node and plug that in over here. I want to store the color. So I'm going to change this from float to color. And I want to store it not for every point, but for every instance. Apart from that, I'm going to name it as instance color or IC. And the value is going to be gotten all the way from this mix shader over here. So let's go ahead and plug this in right to the value over there. Once we have that set, we can go ahead and bring our cursor to the junction of these two windows click and drag to bring this out. And I can just tap N in both of these windows to just remove the side panels. Then I'll switch this over to the shader editor. And over here, I'm gonna change the base color down to something like black, and I'm gonna play around with the emission. For the emission, I'm actually gonna use this IC material that we just created. Let's press Shift A and search for the attribute node, and then plug this color into the color. Now, remember, we did it for every instance. So we're going to change this type from geometry to instancer and the name we're going to type in as IC. Then the last thing that we have to do is not just use the default colors of the noise, but colors that we want for which we're going to press shift A and search for a color ramp node. Before we actually plug in the color ramp node, I actually want to see if the IC is working. And for that, we're going to switch our viewport shading from solid to rendered by pressing this button over here. Then I'm also going to switch off overlays by pressing this button over here. Now everything is black because the strength is kept down at zero. So let's increase the strength to something like one. And you can see how we do have different colors that are coming in from the noise texture. I don't, however, want those colors. So I'm going to plug this color ramp in over here. And I'm just going to press this plus button two times so that we get two more stops. Now I'm going to press this down arrow and choose distribute stops evenly. And I'm going to change these middle values to two colors that I want. So maybe I'll go with something that's a greenish color like that, and maybe a slightly bluish color. Let's go with something like this. And I'll also change this white down to something like black. Now that I have that, if I want it to be a lot more sharp, I can just bring these in as and when I require. And I'm also going to increase the strength to something like three, just so that it's a lot brighter and we'll get a much better bloom effect. Maybe a value of four or five will also do. Apart from that, to get the bloom effect to feel a lot heavier, 
I'm going to actually change the world background all the way to black, or I'll keep it at a very dark value and then make it a little bluish just so that it's not completely black. The next thing that we have to do is the camera and compositing. So let's first select the camera. And if you see the camera is currently arbitrarily placed over there, we want it to be looking straight on. So we're going to press Alt G to clear its location, Alt R to clear its rotation, and then RX 90 to rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees. Then we'll just press GY to bring it back. And then we can go into the camera view by pressing this button over here or tapping zero on your numpad. Then just to fit everything in, you can press GY and bring it back. Or you can actually go to the camera properties over here and reduce the focal length down to something like 25, just so that everything is seen, but you have a much wider field of view. So now I think something like this looks good enough, but we have to add in the compositing effect. So in order to add in the compositing effects, we're going to change this window from the shader editor to the compositor, and we're going to check the use nodes button. Then we're going to go ahead and bring this over to the side and press shift A and search for a glare node. Now this is going to allow us to change this from streaks to bloom to give us the same effect that we used to get in Blender version 4.1 and below. However, we don't actually see any changes and that's because we have to enable the viewport compositing by pressing this little drop down menu and choosing compositor to be viewed during the camera as well. Now you can see the bloom effect come in. Apart from that, I'm going to change the quality to high and I'm going to add in one more node which is actually going to make this render a lot slower, but I think the effect is worth it. And that is actually a filter called the Kuahara. So I'm going to add in this Kuahara filter and I'm going to change this from classic to anisotropic. I'm going to increase the uniformity all the way to 50 and I'm going to increase the eccentricity all the way to 2. Apart from that, remember, because this is a filter, it works based on the pixels. So if I am to see this zoomed out, it's going to look very different as compared to when it's rendered by zooming in. So you have to ensure that you actually render the image and take a look at what the filter looks like to be sure as to the fact that you're getting exactly what you want. You see, rendering takes a very short amount of time. It took only 1.37 seconds to render. However, it's going to take a lot longer to composite. And by changing the size of the Kuahara filter, it might take a lot longer. So right now, this is at a size of 6, and it took only 14 seconds to finish the operation. However, if I close this, I think a size of 20 would look a lot better to get what I felt like. But of course, this is your own personal preference. But then you can go ahead and just render out the image. So after 1 minute 38 seconds at a size of 20, this is the effect that I get, which is a lot more like what I actually want for my final animation. So now that I have that and I'm happy with the exact look of everything, I can go ahead and press render animation to get the final animation. I hope you actually learned something from this tutorial. Maybe the use of geometry nodes, the use of the shader editor, and how you can use attributes, or maybe even compositing. I do plan on making multiple videos using different variations of sci-fi spheres, as well as so many other animations that you could generally find in stock footage websites. If you have any questions, let me know down below, and I will definitely try to answer as many of them for as long as I can, although I'm not really able to respond to too many comments at the moment. However, until my next video comes out, thank you so much for watching. Keep creating and don't forget to stay creative.